I'm Nita Satku, and I'm from the Centre for Biomedical Ethics. This is a lecture on the professional rights and responsibilities of doctors. The lecture will cover the major rights that are protected for doctors in Singapore, as well as the professional responsibilities that they bear, with particular attention to the right of conscientious objection, that is, the right to decline to provide certain services based on deeply held personal beliefs. The content is derived partly from the Singapore Medical Council Ethical Code and Ethical Guidelines, the SMC ECEG. It makes reference to the principles of bioethics as described by Beecham and Childress, to values or virtues that are significant to the profession and to the prevailing law in Singapore. It is universally accepted that doctors are expected to act in the best interests of their patients. As part of the SMC Physician's Pledge, based on the Declaration of Geneva, doctors in Singapore pledge to make the health of their patients their first consideration. There is then an expectation that doctors will place their patients' interests above their own, potentially compromising their own well-being when it is necessary to benefit their patient. This, however, cannot be seen as an absolute duty. Doctors, as autonomous individuals and as members of the profession, have certain rights that are protected by law and by the ethical guidelines of the profession. The ethical basis of these professional rights is that of respect for doctors as autonomous beings. It may be then seen as the ethical and legal duty of the state, the medical council and of healthcare institutions to safeguard or to protect those rights within some limits. The interests of patients and society are also served by recognising and protecting the rights of doctors. This enables doctors to perform their duties at the best of their capabilities and encourages retention of the workforce. At times, doctors' rights may come into direct conflict with their duty to patients. These situations, when they arise in the absence of clear laws or guidelines, call for careful ethical deliberation to minimise harm to either party. Doctors in Singapore have rights that are include, but not limited to the following. The right to be treated with dignity and respect, the right to health, the right to decline to provide medically inappropriate treatment, the right to decline to provide care that conflicts with personal beliefs. First, let us examine the right to be treated with dignity and respect, which is a universal one, based on the concept that all individuals have inherent worth. It is not a right that a person loses when they enter the healthcare profession. Upholding this right for healthcare workers means, among other things, ensuring that they are protected from abuse and provided with reasonable working conditions. Several measures exist to protect doctors from abuse. The first is the Protection Against Harassment Act, which in 2021 was expanded, ex amended to explicitly make it an offence to use abusive or insulting language on public service workers, including healthcare professionals. This behaviour is punishable by a fine or by imprisonment. The SMC ECEG states that you are not obliged to be subjected to abuse of any sort by patients, family members or other accompanying persons. The accompanying ethical handbook further clarifies that while doctors should not retaliate if there is no need for self-defence against physical harm, they should end the engagement with the patient and may potentially even terminate the relationship. It also makes explicit the option of taking legal action against those perpetrating the abuse. The Ministry of Health Tripartite Workgroup for the Prevention of Abuse and Harassment of Healthcare Workers was set up in April 2022 in response to a rise in the number of cases of abuse and harassment against healthcare workers, as well as increased public concern for their well-being, particularly in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Surveys conducted by the workgroup showed that more than two in three healthcare workers said that they had witnessed or personally experienced abuse or harassment in the past year. Half of them, or a third of healthcare workers, witnessed or experienced abuse or harassment at least once a week. And frontline healthcare workers were more likely to experience abuse and harassment. The most common forms documented were shouting, threats by patients or caregivers, complaints, uh, threats to file complaints or take legal 
uh, action against the healthcare workers and making demeaning comments. Physical assault was less common. The work group also found that workplace bullying and harassment by colleagues and supervisors made up 31% of all cases of abuse or harassment witnessed or personally experienced by respondents. This was more commonly experienced by younger or junior staff. While it was usually again in the form of verbal abuse, there were also cases of physical abuse and sexual harassment. The surveys uncovered a persistent underreporting of harassment and abuse. Responses from healthcare workers showed that many believed that they were expected to endure abuse as part of their job. When this abuse was perp perpetrated by patients or caregivers, healthcare workers showed a tendency to empathise with their circumstances and a reluctance to report these issues, which is unsurprising given the values that the profession holds dear. The work group has proposed a set of recommendations that will be implemented with public health care organisations in 2024. Hospitals should first provide definitions of abuse and harassment so that healthcare workers recognise when they should make a report or when they should seek help, and so that potential perpetrators will understand what sort of behaviour is not to be tolerated. There should be clear pathways for reporting and escalation within a culture that encourages reporting rather than dismissal of these situations. And there should be clearly documented consequences for perpetrators. This is aimed at establishing a zero tolerance policy for abuse and, health and harassment of healthcare workers. At the same time, actions will be taken to promote positive relationships between healthcare workers, patients and their caregivers. The right to be treated with dignity and respect also includes being provided with appropriate working conditions. In Singapore, working conditions are covered in the Employment Act and further conditions for healthcare workers are governed by guidelines from the Singapore Medical Council and the Ministry of Health. The Employment Act governs conditions around, governs conditions around doctors' employment in terms of payment of salary, annual leave, sick leave and maternity benefits, among others. But of note, it does not cover working hours, which are a point of concern, especially in the first few years of service. The Singapore Medical Council has guidelines on limits to working hours for junior doctors, one of which stipulates that when averaged out over a month, the total work hours per week of junior doctors should not exceed 80 hours. In a survey from 2021, 84% of junior doctors reported that they were able to work within this limit. A failure to protect doctors from excessively long working hours puts them at risk of developing mental health issues and suffering damage to personal relationships. There are also consequences to society as well, because when doctors are fatigued, they perform suboptimally, and persistent overwork leads to attrition of the workforce that is a failure to retain doctors in the public sector. Doctors have always accepted long working hours as something of a rite of passage in the profession, but this culture is slowly changing in recognition for the need to preserve their well-being and to treat them with respect and dignity. Next, we come to the right to health. Doctors have a right to health and to protect the health of their families and of those close to them. It is accepted that professional duties can involve direct risk to one's health, such as when treating patients with communicable diseases. This risk can be minimised with the use of personal protective equipment. Doctors then have a right to adequate protection in order to minimise risk to their health and, by extension, to minimise risk of transmission of disease to their families. If it will cause minimal risk to the patient's health, it is reasonable for a doctor to delay care until such equipment becomes available or to transfer care to a doctor who has access to adequate protective equipment. This is uncontroversial in non-emergency situations. However, sometimes waiting for protective equipment will result in harm to patients, such as in emergencies or infectious disease outbreaks where there is a shortage of personal protective equipment. In these situations, the doctor's right to health comes directly into conflict with the patient's welfare or with their duty to the patient. Many doctors choose to risk their own health while caring for patients in these situations, but it is difficult to impose a moral obligation to do this. From the ECEG, you must not purely out of fear or prejudice 
refuse to treat patients who have infectious disease, who have infectious disease leaving them without timely care. This means that doctors should not refuse to treat patients because of personal biases or fear that is without medical basis, such as when there is no risk of transmission but the illness is heavily stigmatized. It also makes clear that doctors have a right to ensure that they have adequate personal protective equipment to minimize a risk of infection. Doctors also have the right to refuse to treat a patient who, re who requests medicine or procedure that they judge to be medically inappropriate. Patients sometimes do request investigations or treatment that are not medically beneficial, but that they strongly believe is in their best interest. This can be a consequence of the huge amount of information available to patients today, often through online resources, some of which are legitimate and some less so. Respect for a patient's autonomy means that competent patients have a right to consent or to refuse care that is recommended by their doctors, that is, recommended as a good thing by the doctors, but this does not extend to the right to demand treatment that is non-beneficial, either effect ineffective or harmful. A doctor has the right to preserve their professional integrity by refusing to provide such treatments and should not be pressured into providing those treatments either by the offer of financial incentives or by threats of complaints against them. This should always be communicated to patients respectfully and with compassion particularly when such requests are made in the context of end-of-life care. The ECEG affirms this, stating you must, request, you must respect patients' wishes not to receive specific treatments. At the same time, you are not obliged to provide or to continue treatments that you deem inappropriate, non-beneficial or even harmful in, the view, in view of the natural course of the underlying disease. Persistent requests for inappropriate care may require a termination of the doctor-patient relationship and a transfer of the care of the patient to another doctor. Doctors also have a right not to provide care that conflicts with their personal beliefs. This is known as conscientious objection, when a doctor refuses to provide a legal, legitimate medical intervention because of a deeply held personal belief against it which may be based on religious or moral convictions or for other reasons. This should be communicated respectfully and without implying judgment and without giving the patient the impression that legal and legitimate treatments are unavailable anywhere. And ideally, the doctor should refer patients to other doctors whose personal beliefs do not conflict with the provision of that treatment. Conscientious objection will be discussed in greater detail after the next section.